Um, I am a local nature photographer. Um, I started my serious photography life in 2005, and I've always loved wildflowers. So it was very important for me to figure out how to get close to wildflowers, how to take those photographs. And um, I have enjoyed that. Uh, enjoyed, I have enjoyed that very much. Um, so let's see, I'm going to share my screen. Share, okay. And then I'm going to open my program and um, start to play. Okay, so um, this is a beautiful scene. Coyote Ridge is, uh, Coyote Ridge open space is south of San Jose. It's pretty much only open when, uh, when a docent is present, but it has just this incredible display of wildflowers. We are so fortunate we have so many wildflowers in our area. Okay, I have to keep crossing that out to be able to move. So my philosophy um, about uh, native flowers in particular um, is embodied in this quote, people from a planet without flowers would think we must be mad with joy to have such things about us. And However, flowers weren't always here. Um, they appeared about 100 million years ago um, and they happened, it, before that, uh, plants were pollinated by wind. So there was pollen that was blown from one place to another and they, whoever they is, happened upon a new trick to make sexual reproduction more reliable than trusting one's pollen to the wind. That trick was flowers. And this is kind of my quote, everything we enjoy about flowers, their scent, their colors, marking shapes are designed not for us, but to attract the pollinators. So I thought I would define pollination. It's the transfer of pollen from the male part of the plant. And what you see are the stamens. It's not all there is to the male part, but the stamens are what you see in the flower uh, easily to the female part, the pistil of another flower of the same species enabling fertilization and the production of seeds and common pollinators in our area, butterflies, bees, beetles and ants and hummingbirds. Um, I've seen hummingbirds and I've seen flowers. I don't have a picture of a hummingbird feeding at a na na native flower in our area, but that does, it does, it does happen. <laughs> and, um, okay, let's see. Let's see. So here are some of the pollinators. And um, so you see this ladybug, you see the two bees that are just crawling inside the planet. And of course, butterflies aren't going to do that. Um, they, bees also, that California poppy on the right, um, that they also crawl around inside an open flower. Um, so, and I do have a hummingbird, um, but this was taken down in the desert, uh, the hummingbird photo. So, um, and each flower has its own strategy for attracting the pollinator and its own mechanism for delivering the pollen. And of course, then the pollinator takes the pollen to another plant. Um, the pollen fertilizes uh, the plant and you have new plants the next year. Uh, and you can see how, how the, the, the bees, even large bees, get right in there. And I love this one on the right. I don't know what that insect is, but you can see it's long proboscis going down into the plant. And then I love this one on the bottom. It's called a scorpion fly on this uh, bed of gold fields. It's really strange looking. It has little wings that don't fly anymore. Um, and, uh, but it also is covered with pollen. And then the other thing I wanted to mention that the bees, the bee on the left here has that orange, uh, orange sack in the back, that's the pollen sack. And so they take, they feed on the nectar, take it back um, to where their babies are gonna be born and also pollen. Um, so there's a coevolution that has happened so that the pollinator and the plant have evolved together so that 
everybody gets something out of the deal for the most part. There are a few exceptions, but for the most part, it works as designed. Um, I'm going to talk about identifying wildflowers. Um, uh, there are three families I'm going to talk about because sometimes being able to recognize the family helps you narrow down your search. And then I'm going to uh, talk about blooming time, kind of early, mid, and late. Um, and then where to go in um, the South um, San Francisco Bay Area and what to do in the field so that you'll be able to identify the flower and then some references at the end. So the first family I'm gonna talk about is the sunflower, the composite or sunflower family, um, which the Goldfields is a wonderful example. You see this Pacheco State Park is just this whole uh, hillside is covered with gold fields. And you can imagine that before, before the Europeans came, um, all the hills looked like this. And the, the space between the Hamilton range and, or the Diablo range all the way to the Sierra was covered with flowers like this. So gold fields, you can see there, it looks like it's one flower, but it's actually made up of ray flowers that are around the outside and disc flowers, which are in the center. And each of those is a separate flower, but they've come together um, to attract the pollinator um, in that way. And it's the most common family and that the ray flowers in the center and or the ray flowers around the outside and the disc flowers in the center is a very common strategy. Um, there are some all ray flowers, dandelions being a very common one. So there's no center to a dandelion, it's all the ray flowers. And then um, I couldn't find a native all disc flower, but brass buttons grow by the, by the coast. Um, and you can see it's like the center of a sunflower, right? But no ray flowers. So there, it's not native, but it does illustrate the point. Um, probably the largest composite that we have is this Muellier. So it's, it's like a sun, it looks more like a sunflower and it's a nice good sized bush. And then when it goes to seed that the flower, the photo on the right is what it looks like when it goes to seed those, um, those uh, disc flowers in the center. Um, so it's kind of a later in the season, not at the end of the season, but kind of mid season, you see these, uh, you see these flowers, these bushes and flowers, and they're very attractive to butterflies. And then tidy tips is another common. These are low growing. Um, I, I think they're just fascinating. I love them. Um, and um, they have the yellow center, um, the disc, and then it has yellow. There are also white tidy tips, but those are further south. I haven't seen any up here. So they're very, um, there's something very charming about them, I think. Tidy tips. And then there are two kinds of yarrow that we have. The common yarrow that you see everywhere. I think it grows everywhere, just about everywhere in the state of California. Um, and golden yarrow. And again, that same pattern, the outer, what look like petals are actually the ray flowers and then the disc flowers in the center. Um, gum plant. Um, I have trouble telling coastal and Great Valley apart, I have to tell you, but you can always tell gum plant because it has that white center uh, when it's closed as a bud and it's sticky if you put your finger on it. Um, it's like a post-it note. It doesn't, it's not gooey to your finger. Uh, and the gooey part doesn't come off on your finger, but you can feel that it's sticky and presumably it's designed to coat, to protect those disc flowers when they're in the bud. Um, these often grow along water and grow quite a long time. These actually were taken probably in July. So they go for quite a long time. Plant. Um, blow wife, if you see the flower, I'd be surprised. They're very low growing. You really, the thing that alerts you to that you've got blow wives around is that you see the seeds, um, this nice little um, collection of seeds, and then you start looking for the flowers. 
So, and you can see it's all, those are all ray flowers. Uh, thistles are also composites and we have, we have a lot of non-native thistles in our area, but these are some of the natives, this Venus thistle and the cobweb, gee, I wonder why it's called that, right? It's the one over here on the right. So it has all that, that filament. Um, and then the Mount Hamilton thistle, there's also a San Francisco thistle, but I've never gotten a picture of one. So um, thistles are also composites, belong to the composite family. And here are just some more. So some of them grow in the sun, some of them grow uh, in the shade, like the woodland media is a shade flower. Um, the two on the right, the seaside daisy and the lizard tail grow out along the coast, so they grow later. Uh, you can see those in July. Um, yellow pincushion, Pacific aster is a fall and is a fall flower. Um, so they pretty much have that basic pattern of the disc flowers in the center and the ray flowers on the outside. The second flower I want to talk about is the pea family or bean or legume family. And a common, a common genus is the lupin. Um, there are two bush lupins, the silver bush lupin on that left and the coastal bush lupin on the right. They're on large, uh, large bushes, whereas the gully lupin is kind of medium uh, and the bicolor lupins are very short. So when you see, I think those pictures at Russian Ridge of poppies and lupin, it's mostly the bicolor lupin. And I'm not sure why it's called bicolor because most lupins, many lupins have more than one color, but that's what they call it. And here's another common one, the sky lupin. And this is this beautiful, um, walkway at Rancho Cañada del Oro, which is uh, south and the south part of San Jose, um, just a field and the fragrance, oh my gosh, when, you, when the, the, the fragrance just is wonderful. And I wanted to say something about the name Lupin because it actually means wolf-like. Um, L-O-U-P is the French word um, for wolf. Um, and I assume that the Spanish word is similar. Um, and so the genus, the name of the genus is Lupinus, and then there's the various species. So it was named this wolf-like because someone who was exploring the flowers early in the, in, um, the European American era um, noticed that sometimes lupin grows where there are not a lot of other flowers. And they thought that it did something bad to the soil. And so they called it wolf because wolves were considered to be bad, that they killed other animals and you just wanted to get rid of them and not have them around. Well, it turns out that lupins are actually nitrogen fixing. They put nitrogen into the soil, which is good for other flowers. So they actually provide a benefit just the way wolves um, They've done studies that show when you have wolves or you in, reintroduce wolves, like at Yellowstone, it brings balance back to the ecosystem because they kill mainly uh, the old and sick ones, the slow ones. So it's um, kind of interesting that this projection has named a whole, a whole genus of uh, flowers, um, kind of misnamed them. So it's just an interesting little story. Um, the clovers are also members of the pea family. Um, there are a lot of non-native clovers, but these are two. I love the bag clover. I mean, <laughs> it's just a collection of little bags, right? And then of course the Pacific pea, which grows in shady areas. Um, pea obviously being a member of the pea family. And then the other family that helps to know, I think it's good to know about is the mint family. And the wood mint grows in shady areas. The coyote mint is kind of a later bloomer. It blooms in the sun. And chia pretty much blooms, well, it blooms on hillsides, so out in sunny areas. And what they have in common is a square stem. So if you look at a plant 
and you feel the stem, you feel the edges. It's got a square rather than a rounded stem. And then if you rub the, the leaves and your fingers, you'll have a lovely scent. Well, some people don't think it's lovely, but it's a distinctive, it's a distinctive aroma. And that's will tell you that it's a member of the link of the mint family, whether it has that in the name or not. So some other flowers are the sage, uh, these three sages. So I'm not sure why it's called black sage because the flowers are white, but black sage is a very common uh, chaparral plant on hillsides. Um, hummingbird sage, a little more specialized and you can see, gosh, I wonder what pollinates the hummingbird sage. You can see that anything that has that kind of a narrow opening um, is gonna be pollinated by hummingbirds. And then the pitcher sage, you saw a picture earlier of a bee climbing into that tube. Um, they're late, kind of on the late side uh, of blooming, but you can see big, huge bushes of pitcher sage. So the sages are also a member of the mint family and they are aromatic, the leaves are aromatic. And then finally, I guess this is the fourth, it's the lily family. Now I have to say that it used to be that iris were part of the lily family and now they're in the iris family. And the, the naming of families is done using DNA and genetics now. So um, things that you might think go together, don't go together anymore. So we're at the, we're at the mercy of the scientists, which is fine. Um, so the lily family, the particularly the mariposa lilies are just so beautiful. And when you see them, they're unmistakable. So that's a nice thing. You don't mix them up with some other kind of flower. So this is a very common uh, mariposa lily. Mariposa means butterfly in Spanish. So you can see why somebody thought it reminded them of butterflies, that beautiful coloring on the inside and on the outside. Um, and the genus is Calicordus. And there's a Calicordus Society in California. And I once had this um, pipe dream of traveling all around California and getting photos of all the Calicordus, which would be a really fun undertaking. They're so beautiful. And here's the yellow Mariposa lily. It's a late bloomer. It's not quite as, doesn't have quite as much fancy detail, but it's still, unmistakable. The other thing I wanted to say about the lily family is that you either have three petals or you have six petals. And um, so if you see a three petaled plant and you see leaves that are long and thin, you're pretty much looking at a lily or an iris, if it's an iris, but you can tell the difference between mariposa lilies and iris, of course. So, um, but they have either three or six petals. That's a characteristic. Um, so the yellow mariposa lily, and then this butterfly mariposa lily, which you can find further south, like at the Pinnacles. They have a lot of these, and they're just, you know, they're just exquisite, aren't they? They just are gorgeous. And then when the sun comes either from the side or from the top, you know, they say, oh, don't take pictures when the sun's, you know, when it's noon. Well, some flowers do better when the sun is high. And these are, uh, it, it, the sun fills the bowl and you get these just beautiful flowers. Um, there's a Tiburon Mariposa lily, which is endemic, only found uh, on Ring Mountain in uh, near Tiburon. And it's kind of a, a funny looking, all that furry, all that furry stuff. Um, and then the more, much more common uh, globe lily or kind of fantastically named fairy lantern, which grows in shady areas, uh, Calicordus albus. And when you think, so obviously these attract different pollinators because the Tiburon mariposa lily is open. So butterflies can come and they can keep an eye out for predators. Um, really anything except hummingbirds can, can fertilize that. Whereas the globe lily, you know, no, no butterfly is gonna go into that little narrow space to get inside. 
So it's probably fertilized by small bees or ants um, because who else can get in there? So it's just things have developed to attract and be per pollinated by particular kinds of pollinators. And it's really interesting to think about that. Um, and then there are the six petal. So the fritillaries, um, the chocolate lily or mission bells is also a fritillary, um, but it's common name is either chocolate lily or mission bells. The fragrant fritillaries you can find now at Edgewood County Park. They're, I've heard that they're out. And then this beautiful leopard uh, lily on the right um, was actually in the redwoods and kind of late in June. Um, but these are all, these are all six petal lilies, but they don't really look like anything else. Um, you'd see them and you'd say, yeah, it looks like a lily. Um, then the other way to identify flowers that, that can help you is what's blooming, what's likely to be blooming where you are. And so the early ones, which are out now, are the hound's tongue, called that because the leaves, evidently, somebody thought the leaf looked like a dog's tongue. They're kind of long and I don't, I don't think they're wet, but they look like a dog's tongue. Uh, milkmaids, um, they both, these both grow in, in shady places, the fetid adder's tongue also, uh, which um, I didn't actually, when I took this picture, I didn't actually, I think you have to be pretty close to smell it. I guess it doesn't smell good, but again, it has three petals and um, grows, these all grow in dark and shady areas, uh, which is not surprising because early in the year, there's not a lot of sun in the sunny places. Another early, the iris are pretty early. There are two basic kinds, the whitish yellow one, the Fernald's iris, and then the blue Douglas iris. There's also a ground iris, but it's not as common. So if, if you see a purple one, it's probably a Douglas iris. Um, they are beautiful flowers. And of course, many kinds have been domesticated. Uh, warrior's plume is, it used to be called Indian warrior. And it is a, um, it does have green leaves. You can see those little frilly leaves, but it also feeds um, on uh, decaying matter underground. And that's why it has warrior in the name because someone who named it that thought that it showed where Native American warriors had died and were buried and then the flowers came up. So uh, I don't know if that's true. Um, it's been changed from Indian warrior to warrior's plume. Um, all of these, so the warrior's plume grow in the shade. The sun cups, of course, grow out in the sun. These, the, all, both of these were taken at Edgewood County Park, um, different, different places in the park, but this is the time to see them. Uh, the sun cups are out in sunny areas um, and uh, they are close to the ground and are, you know, are lovely, all that, that bright sunny. So sometimes people confuse warrior's plume with um, um, paintbrush, but when you look at them, they don't, paintbrush doesn't have these little frilly leaves. It's a different color red. It, it grows in the sun, not in the shade. Um, they don't really look alike, except that they have these red, red flowers. Um, kind of tubular flowers or flat, flat flowers coming out. Um, cream cups, I think cream cups are just lovely. I love the little shadows from the stamens. Um, and I took this picture last year at Rancho San Vicente, which is part of Calero County Park. And I mean, just look at that hillside of poppies and cream cups. And they individually are really cute. And then you just see this mass on the hillside. And they're obviously field flowers, sun, sunny flowers. And actually California poppies grow oh, anytime that there's some water and some sun. So they're not just early plants. 
they're around, um, they start early, they're around for a long time. You can see some even in the developed areas of our, uh, of our, um, of our system. Um, they mostly they're orange or orange yellow. They're more yellow near the coast. You see more yellow poppies near the coast. There are some red ones and there are some white ones. Um, but um, they are just, for me, they are just the most photogenic of plants. Um, and <laughs> you can see them in lots and lots of places. And here's um, Coyote, Harvey, Harvey Bear Coyote Lake County Park um, is uh, south of San Jose. And um, you can see this whole field of poppies with a few cream cups. And then in the background, you can see a little yellow on the hill. So it's probably gold fields. Um, so when you have a mass of California poppies, it is just magnificent. And you can see why between gold fields and California poppies, kind of the yellow orange, and then the blue of the lupin, you can see why California state colors and the colors of all the University of California schools is blue and gold, because that's, that's what the first people who lived here and then the Europeans who came, that was what they discovered. Um, just some more flowers, um, the blue, blue witch, um, both of these exemplify how the flower helps the pollinator find it. Because as you look at the centers of both of these flowers, there's no question that it's telling you where you're supposed to go. So on the left, you have that circle of green with a white lining, and then you have uh, the center part of the flower. And then on the right, that um, Johnny Jump Up, which is a pansy, obviously, <clears throat> those lines just say here, you know, it's like those people who stand on street corners holding signs with long arrows saying, you know, go to this office, go to this business. It's just like saying, come here. This is where the goodies are. So Johnny Jump Up is a lovely blue, which is a little more, grows on the hillsides, maybe a little more shade. Johnny Jump Ups love the sun. Um, but I thought that they belong together because they are so definite about where the, the, the bee probably is supposed to come. Oh, these are just two favorite, favorite flowers, the shooting stars. Um, they, somebody once called them surprised. They look like their hair has been blown back, right? Um, and the difference isn't actually the color of the flower because there are purple Padres shooting stars. It's the color of the stem. So if you have a green stem, it's the Padres shooting star. And if you have a red stem, it's the woodland shooting star, but they both have that very distinctive um, shape. Then mid-season, when the fiddle necks come out, they cover the, they can cover the hills. And you can see why they're called fiddle necks because of that twist at the end. Um, checker blooms are out in the open field. Um, and blue dicks are pretty much in sunny areas at hillsides. Um, it's a collection of individual flowers into a, into a cluster. Um, and their blue dicks are usually very common. But it can vary from year to year, I have to say. So these are the ones that you'll maybe start seeing now and on through May. The blue-eyed grass, which isn't a grass, it's an eyed grass that's blue. <laughs> since it obviously doesn't have a blue eye. And again, you can see why blue and gold are colors for the state of California, um, because that's that one on the left, you have gold fields in the background. And uh, so these are sunflowers, sun, sun loving flowers, uh, also the baby blue eyes. And there are two varieties that are a subspecies apart, but they all have those lines again there's no question in the pollinator's mind where it's supposed to come, right? Those lines say, yep, right here. This is where you're supposed to come. But there are two, two varieties that you may see when you're out. 
I don't know if it's the soil, different soil attracts different the different coloring or exactly what it is, but sometimes you can see one and sometimes you can see another. Um, cow parsnip is a huge bush with these long stems and then this umbel, like an umbrella, like ribs of an umbrella. And like the composites, they're open, so they attract um, flying uh, pollinators like the butterfly. And if you look at this one in the center, you can see two, two little green beetles with black spots. Um, it attracts all kinds of pollinators. Um, and uh, on the right, you can see what it looks before it blossoms forth. So, and then it actually also has very interesting uh, seeds too. So cow parsnip is, um, grows along tall along the trail in the sun. And the soap plant is a very interesting plant. You, you see those leaves on the ground when you're hiking on an open trail. And, um, and then later in the season, you see a spike coming up out of there, but it has buds on it. And you're going to, when does this, you know, I've seen the buds, but I've never seen the flower. What's the deal? Well, if you were hiking in the afternoon, you would see the flowers. Um, it it does it blooms in the afternoon rather than the morning so if you're if you only hike in the morning which is a good time since there's no wind um you would wonder why you know what the flowers ever looked like it has it's an interesting plant because it has an interesting bulb so the bulb um first of all the fluid from the bulb so you know bulbs are kind of you know can be mushed because they've got a lot of fluid in them um, it was used by the native people like a shampoo or like soap. It also has a chemical in it, which when put in water, it stuns the fish. So if you're trying to catch your dinner, you'd rather have a slow moving fish than a fast moving fish. So um, it was used uh, to help fish. And then that bulb could be dried and all those little hairs, uh, filaments in there, could be could make it into a brush, and this is an example of a brush that um, what is not an ancient brush. It was made by a friend, but it's in the style of how the native people use the bulb um, to make a brush for their hair or for anything else that needed brushing. So it's an extremely useful plant, and um, the flower, or the leaves are very characteristic. That kind of curly, very flat uh, leaf uh, on the ground. Then there are these little, I want to include a little few little flowers. You can see they used to be called Lenanthus. Now they're called Leptosiphon. Who knows? Um, they're very tiny. Um, you see a lot of this one on the left. You can see at Edgewood County Park. The one on the right is from Rancho Canada del Oro and grows on particularly on serpentine. So I should say something on serpent, about serpentine. Um, it's the reason we have so many flowers. It's, um, uh, it was the, the rock was laid down in the ocean and then um, was um, you know, scraped off as, as the um, two sides of the fault came together. And then because there were earthquakes, the, the soil got squeezed and rubbed together. And um, it has a characteristic that it is, it is high in toxic chemicals, things like mercury, um, which we know we have a lot of in our area because there were mercury mines here. And so it helps the native plants grow because they've adapted to the toxicity of the soil. Um, but it, um, the non-native plants sometimes have trouble with that soil. So the reason we have these fields of wildflowers is because the soil is better. They're better adapted to the soil than the non-natives. Um, so uh, serpentine is definitely, it's the state rock of California. And it's, you can see outcrops of it. It's kind of gray and it's, it looks, it's greasy the way a snake skin is greasy. It's not really greasy, but it feels, it's so smooth that it feels greasy. Um, and that's why it's called serpentine because it's, 
feels like a snake skin. At least that's what somebody thought. Um, and another uh, little small plant, these bird's eye galia um, are just so adorable and really small. This Rancho Canada del Oro has this wonderful one time I came at the right time and the hillside was just covered with them. They're very low to the ground. They have this wonderful little face and a little yellow in the bottom of the tube. And this ant, I didn't realize until I got the photo home that it had pollen on its head. So even though it can't get its feet in there very well, it carries, it is carrying pollen to another flower. And then the California gillia is a little different, um, but it's another five petal little gillia. Wild cucumber is very common. You see it sprawling all over the trail, all over rocks. Um, and you can see the flower, how the flower looks in the center with the four petals. And then it has tendrils that reach out to anchor it to other plants. And so they often curl up in, in very interesting ways. And then the one at the bottom right is what, it doesn't look like a cucumber, does it? But that is the cucumber seed and certainly looks pretty well protected. Um, but you see wild cucumber grows very commonly along trails um, all over the Bay Area. Here are the two Castilea. So if you ever wondered where the name of the school came from, it's from this genus of flower. So there are several different paint brushes. Um, you know, obviously somebody thought that it looked like someone had dipped that flower into a paint, a, a, a can of paint and a can of red paint. And so they're called paint brushes. And then um, the purple owl's clover, which is not a clover, um, it, it's got those little faces up at the top. So those little pink and yellow spots, someone thought they looked like owl eyes and sometimes they do. Um, so you can see there's a little similarity in the style of the flower, but they both are have the genus Castilea. And you see lots of all of these. And then two members of the buttercup, the ranunculus family, the crimson columbine, which is kind of at the late end, um, and buttercups, which grow early and stay late, um, uh, are both pretty, buttercups are very common. Crimson columbines are in shadier areas a little later in the season, but they're just so interesting and they're called columbine because it means dove-like and that somebody thought that the, the petals with the little flyaway wings looked like a dove. So that's why it's called a columbine. And um, two different monkey flowers that are very common. The common mo monkey flower grows in wet areas. The sticky monkey flower grows on bushes, on hillsides and hot places. And particularly the one on the left, again, those dots just say, come here, come here. And they both are, can, as long as there's a wet seat, you'll see the common monkey flower. Sticky monkey flowers are pretty much everywhere. There's a dry area. And somebody must have thought that the face of this flower looked like a monkey. Uh, who knows? <laughs> then as you get into May through June, not as many flowers are blooming. Uh, the Chinese houses, um, which are, you can see masses of them. They're lovely, interesting looking flowers. Um, the Indian pink, which grows in a shady area. Ethereal spear, ethereal is, um, uh, now I'm trying to remember, but ethereal was a character in uh, I think Paradise Lost and this is obviously his spear. And these you see, the Indian pink you see in the shade, the ethereal spear you see out in the open fields. And then these are the 
kind of the last, when you see these flowers, you know that spring is going to be ending soon. That's they are, um, farewell to spring is a really good name. Um, there are several different Clarkias um, that are kind of hard to distinguish, but they, um, they definitely look alike. And then the elegant Clarkia, which is a late plant, has these wonderful, unusual looking petals. Um, and then red, red stamens. So they, they are really um, beautiful looking. But when you see the Clarkias, you know that the spring is going to be waning. And then one more thing. I'm sure you all know what this is, poison oak. So particularly if you're photographing and you're going to move a little, a branch or a leaf out of the way so you get a better picture, just make sure it's not poison oak. <laughs> or if you get down on the ground, I got a really bad case of poison oak by leaning into the, the, the leaves are toxic, the flowers are toxic, the stems are toxic. So just be very careful. They do have interesting flowers and I, I captured this at Edgewood County Park. Um, you can see the bee has his pollen sack. He's heading in um, to, I don't know what honey made from poison oak tastes like. I assume it's not lethal, <laughs> but just beware. There's a lot of poison oak in our area. It loves to grow here and just be careful if you, because you can get a really bad rash. Um, so that's my one more thing. We have so many places that have been saved and are a distance from highways. Um, with the exception of Edgewood County Park, most of these are far away from highways, from freeways. And cars emit nitrogen. Of course, not, not electric cars, but um, gasoline cars emit nitrogen. And nitrogen favors the invasive plants. Um, they work really hard at Edgewood to keep the non-native plants at bay, but almost all of these are a distance away from freeways um, so that the native plants have a chance. And I've just put my favorite ones, Edgewood County Park is wonderful, it's wonderful right now. Um, we have Santa Clara County Parks, San Mateo County Parks, the city of Palo Alto, I love Foothills, now it's called Foothills Nature Preserve and it's open to everyone. Uh, it has wonderful flowers. And then up on Skyline, which is when where Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District has its um, most of its sites, uh, Montebello, Russian Ridge, Skyline Ridge, Windy Hill are all wonderful places. They're later in the season because it's cooler up there. Um, so we always we always start uh, we always start. Um, south of San Jose where it's warmer earlier and then work our way further north and further up in altitude um, as the sunflower as the flower season proceeds. San Jose oh, Rancho Canyano del Oro is just wonderful. It has many different kinds of it has trees, it has open fields, it has combinations of both and different flowers at different times. So um, Pacheco State Park, which is on the way, between Gilroy and the Central Valley. Uh, it's up on the ridge, it's a, it has wonderful. And then um, Pinnacles also has wonderful flowers and has different environments. So you'd see different ones. So those are some of my favorite places to go. And then what I suggest, um, it, you do have to do a little work to learn to identify anything but a California poppy. And so before the hike, look at a local guide, what you're going to, what you might see. And then when you're out, just use your phone, take photos of the flower, take photos of the bracts underneath because sometimes those help identify your flower. And then the leaves, both an individual leaf and um, on the stem, how, how, they're, how the leaves are distributed on the stem because that makes a difference. And then note the environment. So things pretty much grow either in the woods, they grow in an open field, or they grow in a marshy area. And then you can look at an app if you're in the field, or you can go home, um, look at an online guide. Friends of Edgewood has every flower that's found in Edgewood County Park. Uh, 
Henry Coe State Park also has um, all the flowers that are found there. And so when you get home from the hike, look at the guide again. And if you have, Cal Flora is a wonderful website, but you have to know something about what you're looking for. You can do a search. So if you think it's a lily, you can look up lily and it'll give you, you know, 50 different lilies that you can look through. Um, but you have to have a sense of what it might be in order to use Cal Flora. Um, and then somebody was saying, she just tries to add a new flower every year. So even though I'm really familiar with the flowers, before I go out, I look at a field guide and go, oh yeah, this is, that's what this is. <laughs> um, to kind of get it in your mind because um, you do have to exert a little effort to learn to identify the flowers, no question about that. And then, um, so, I actually have a lot of flowers on my website. Um, if you go to earthwitnessphoto.com and particularly if you click through to my old website, which there's a link that will take you there in my California wildflower albums, I have a lot of flower pictures. And I also have a book, so uh, called Wildflower Madness, which is based on that quote. Um, how people from a planet without flowers would be must would think we must be mad with joy to have such things around us. So I called it Wildflower Madness. It's also a small book that you can carry with you, or you can just it's books on blurb are expensive, but if you get a PDF or an ebook, it's a lot less expensive and you can have it on your phone. Um, and then so I mentioned Friends of Edgewood and Henry Coe State Park. It's harder to find books. I like the Spring Wildflowers of Co Henry Coe State Park by Barry Breckling, but when I went on the website, they said they didn't have it. It may be out of print. Might contact them and say, how about reprinting this? Because for me, it's the best book of local flowers. Um, there's some variation between South Bay and you know, further north along the peninsula, but not a lot. So almost any flower you want. Uh, Barry Breckling has a photo. He has a description, which my books do not have because I'm not a botanist. Um, and it's my go-to uh, wildflower book. Um, I've never used iNaturals, but I know people, you know, take a picture and they put it there and say, who knows what this is? So you might try that. My husband uses the Santa Monica Mountains. Again, flowers don't vary. There are some flowers which are endemic or which are in a whole, you know, vary in where they are in area, but there are many flowers that are same north and south, particularly in the, in the foothills. And so Tony really likes the Santa Monica Mountains app. There's also a San Francisco Bay Area wildflowers and something called Seek. And Basically, you say what color it is, and they give you a, you know, a bunch of flowers. So, um, and we just have, we also have other online resources. So, California Native Plant Society of Santa Clara Valley is, is a wonderful uh, resource. Peninsula Open Space Trust has a wildflower guide. It has a guide for hikes. It has field guides. Um, for Southern California, Desert USA tells you what's blooming in Anza Borrego or Death Valley. Um, so you can look at look those up and see, gosh, let's go down there this weekend. Well, once we can all travel, right? Theater Payne also has a wildflower hotline for Southern California and um, it comes up as far north as the Pinnacles. So you might get a pointer about the Pinnacles. And then there's something called Natural History Wanderings and he posts whatever reports he can glean, and those are Northern California as well as Southern California. And um, um, Drew is gonna send out these lists so you don't have to be madly copying anything down. Should have told you that at the beginning. And then I just have a piece of self-promotion. Um, I am a member of Gallery House, which is on California Avenue in Palo Alto. 
And this um, ball of wildflowers on the right is one of the, my pieces that I have in the show. It's in the cafe, not in the gallery uh, proper. And um, I had a little fun with Photoshop and um, made a ball of wildflowers and you might enjoy going in to see it. So um, I thank you very much. Tony and I had lunch at this spot. Can you imagine just these beautiful clouds and the beautiful flowers on Russian Ridge? And I just thank you for coming and happy trails. And we're gonna see if we can manage the questions from all of you. Um, Wendy's gonna do that to help out. Yeah, well, actually, let me say a word or two um, before we start questions. I want to give a huge thank you and a sort of silent round of applause for Judy for giving us her time to go over all thank those you. flowers with us. Um, that was a great program. Again, we were the environmental volunteers. Um, I'm going to post a link to our website in the chat if you want to check us out, um, see what we do, how you can become involved. Um, I'm also going to loop link um, Judy's website so you can see more flowers. And like Judy mentioned, I'm also going to be sending out a list of all those references, all those links that Judy mentioned. I'll send that out in an email to all our participants. So if you didn't write those down, if you wanna check those out later, um, I'll get that to you next week. Um, and then I will pass it over to questions. If you have any questions, we'll give a little time for that. Please put them in the chat. I'll also be saving the chat log. So if your question doesn't get answered, hopefully we can answer it later in an email. All right, and then go ahead, okay. Judy and Allison. So Wendy, you're gonna manage this, right? Uh, yes, I will, I will go ahead and do that. So um, I'm gonna start from the top um, at the beginning. And one of the questions was about the bees and you had mentioned a, a pollen sack. And so um, somebody had said they had thought the pollen was just on um, the legs. You know, I don't actually know the answer to that. I just know and, that. And I think it's I've a terminology, seen, it's a terminology thing. Um, I've seen bees that have sacks and I've seen bees that carry it on their legs. So I think they do both. It probably depends what's on their leg may just go to another flower where what's in the sack they take back to the hive but not all bees are hive uh, bees i'm not a bee expert but not all bees are hive bees and so you know it may be related to that um so some bees have them and some bees don't that's all i can tell you okay um and then the next question um was about the paintbrush um somebody had asked if the paintbrush was part of the mint family no it's not a mint and if you feel the stem, it's round. Uh, it's, um, I think it's the oral banch. It, it's used to be a different family. I can look it up. Castilla. No, it's, but I know it's not a mint. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the Castilla uh, Leha. Right. Um, and so somebody had said that they saw pink lily, uh, it's not pink lilies, pink poppies um, in someone's front yard the other day. And so um, they assume that they're, they're not native. And That's they, correct. I've never seen pink. Um, well, they might be native to another part of California, but they're not native to this area. Okay. A lot of uh, things people grow in their gardens that are kind of like wildflowers, but aren't aren't native. Whatever, native is a relative term, of course, but you know, native from when? But uh, they're probably um, domestic plants. And somebody had um, asked about collecting seeds. Is it okay to uh, harvest seeds from wildflowers in a public open space for distribution in other fields nearby? Um, I would guess not. You're, you're not supposed to do anything to anything that you find in public open space. However, California Native Plant Society, well, you can buy seeds at, at, a, at a, I mean, you can buy them at, um, Summerhill. Um, California Native Plant Society sells native plants and probably seeds. Um, um, Actera, I think, has a seed. They grow native plants. So I'd suggest you do it that way rather than you're, you're not supposed to do anything to plants on, in open space. Okay. Um, so question was asked about the soap plant. Why yes. is it called a soap plant? Well, because if you squish the bulb, it makes a soapy substance that the native people use to wash with. They, they wash their hair. I assume they wash other things with it. 
So that's, it's the bulb produces something, which, um, you know, it's interesting because it also stuns fish. So I don't know, maybe it's not that great on your hair, but um, it, it was used, uh, the, the juice from the bulb uh, was used as a, as a shampoo or soap. Thank you. Um, do you know which plants uh, are poisonous to animals, such as cats and dogs? Um, I actually think no native plants are poisonous to animals, but I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't actually know the answer to that. Nobody's ever asked that question. So I think it's, it's like poinsettias are poison. Um, those big, beautiful bushes on the freeway are poison. Um, but I don't actually know. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust your cat or dog to what I had to say. I think you have to look that up someplace. Okay. Um, and um, some, some personal things. Um, what is your favorite California wildflower? Oh, the California poppy, poppy, definitely. They just are so beautiful. They, you know, whether it's, if it's shady, they have a different look. If it's sunny, you get, you get little like that little sweat bee. Um, you can get interesting things. Um, and there's the bud, there's the partially open bud, there's the, I mean, there are just so much variety. So California poppies are probably my very favorite, most favorite flower, native flower. Okay, and somebody asked, do you use any um, lens baby lenses? I use a macro lens on my camera and that gets me close enough. Um, so I have um, a single lens reflex camera with a macro lens. Most of those, many were taken with my Nikon, but as I've gotten older, I need a lighter camera. So I have a Nikon or a Sony mirrorless camera, but I have a macro lens on it that will get me one-to-one. -one. So the, um, I've never put anything more on that. And I haven't used a long lens to take flower pictures unless it was something that was really far away. Um, I like what a macro lens does to the flower and to the background. So okay. that's... Um, right, and there was a question that came up about the, the camera and the macro lens. So I think that just answered that as okay. well. It's a, I think the Sony lens is 95 millimeters. The Nikon lens was 105 millimeters. So it's that kind of medium medium range. Um, I mean, you can take flower pictures with any camera, you know, with a phone, with any camera, but for the effect that I like, I like to use a macro lens. Okay. Now, the next question I, I, I did not understand, and so maybe the person who um, asked it can clarify it a little bit. Um, it was typed out, Judy, the book is see-through, is the cover green? Well, yeah, it probably... Oh, I'm sorry, because you had the virtual lens on. Yeah, um, I do. Here, now I can see it. What it is. Um, this is what it looks. This is what the, the physical book looks like. Um, I'm hoping that the right the writing is background, backwards on my screen. I hope it's forwards. The wildflower madness. And um, if you go to blurb.com and look it up, you can, you can find it. And as I said, get get something inexpensive that goes on your phone. Well, or your... Perfect. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that did it. Um, while we were talking about the soap plant, um, the question came up about what is the family name of soap plant. Um, let's see. It used to be a lily. I'm not sure it's still a lily because they changed all that. So I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Yeah. If you go to Calflora, look up soap plant. It will give you all that information, but I can't offhand. I'd have to look it up in my book, and I don't want to take Just the time. To to it. It's chlorogalum, C H L O R O G A L U M. Okay, great. Okay, um, let's see. And the there was a question about the recording. Yes, um, we are recording it. Um, I think I believe Drew, you will make the recording available. Yeah, I'll be sending out the recording to anybody who missed it, or maybe if participants want to watch it again, but this has all been recorded and that'll be available later. Okay. And I think there's one more that I missed up here. Um, is cow parsnip in the same family as hog head? Wait, say, it, say it again, I'm sorry. Is cow parsnip yes. in the same family as hog head, H-O-G-G? -G? 
You know, I don't know what hog's head is. It's the same family as parsley and carrots. So it's the parsley carrot family. I actually don't know what hog's head is. And I don't either. Okay, and I, I believe I've captured um, all the questions. Some of them were answered, I think, in chat um, along the way, so I didn't repeat those. Um, so if I've missed any ones, could you please retype it in chat for us? No. As I said, we are so fortunate that so many people have worked to save um, land up in the skyline and down south of San Jose so that otherwise we wouldn't have these flowers. So, yeah. And I'll, I'll add that I just was in Calero County Park yesterday and there are quite a few wildflowers that are visible and out there um, along yeah. the hills. And so this yeah. is, this is, yeah, <laughs> this is the time to start. So I know Edgewood has flowers and I'm sure south, any of those parks south of San Jose, um, particularly um, Calero, Rancho Cañada del Oro, um, the ones that are kind of more, a little more on the flat, um, have uh, those flowers are starting. And, you know, it's not going to be a long season, I don't think, because we haven't had much rain, but you know, we don't understand, I don't understand anyway, how, what decides and the grass will be lower, so that is helpful to the flowers. So it may be a short season, but um, I think there are always flowers. <laughs> a couple more questions came in um, from Plum. She wants to know, um, how long have you been photographing wildflowers? Um, well, I started my photography life in 2005 and it was the next year that I took a workshop. Um, and I, I borrowed a macro lens uh, to go with my SLR. And, and when I looked through the lens at a poppy bud that had dew on it, it was like, all right, I'm in love. I love this. So it was really 2006 when I started figuring out how to get the kind of flowers that I want, that I wanted with a blurred background, you know, color if you can get it. Um, so that's, well, that's 15 years ago, so I've been doing it for a while. Okay, and then um, the next question is, what climate change, with climate change rather, um, will wildflowers move to other locations? Well, I think that they certainly will move up to where it's cooler, but they're used to, I mean, you can go, like we went to um, Santa Teresa County Park, south of San Jose, it's just different flowers. Um, it's pretty hot down there and yeah, they will definitely be moving up when it gets so hot that they can't tolerate it. Um, and just like the pikas that live on mountaintops, the ones that like the mountains, when it gets really hot up there, they won't have any place to go, but that's, that's probably a little ways off, but, um, yeah, it will. And certainly the lack of rain, um, if we're really into a longer drought period, which we may well be, um, you know, it is going to have an impact on the flowers. And then I think there was a response to one of the questions that was asked earlier about things being poisonous to um, cats and dogs. Um, yeah, I don't know that. that. Mountain misery is poisonous to cattle. Um, and I don't know what mountain misery um, I'm not sure. I know they use cattle grazing um, to um, at certain times to the cattle eat the non-native plants. And so that makes space for the flowers, the native flowers to come through. So grazing is being used. I don't think, I mean, local weed is, doesn't grow up here. So I have not heard of a plant up here that is poisonous to cattle. Mm -hmm. Um, and quest question about, um, do you teach in-person workshops or will you in the future? So say, say it again. Will you, do you have plans to teach um, in-person workshops? No, um, I like to do kind of one and done things. So I give an overview. Um, I think if you want, um, more of a class, uh, look up the California Native Plant Society of Silicon Valley or Santa Clara Valley and they will, um, um, I'm a photographer more than a teacher. So I, I yeah, 
So I'm not, I'm not teaching a class on wildflower identification, at least not yet. Okay, and then I also have to say I'm not a botanist. I'm an amateur, but I I have spent a lot of time taking pictures and a lot of time working to identify the flowers. And um, our question about hoghead was posted. Um, it's a giant hogweed which is native to Britain. We had quite a few people on from um, on the other side of the pond, so to speak. Um, from I saw one from Scotland and also. Right. Um, you know, I don't know anything. I have. I know that some of our non-native plants come from that part of the world and some of our, I've been in Ireland where the, um, uh, you know, things that we have are growing wild and they're not happy about that. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I actually don't know anything about, uh, thank you for coming on the call and I hope you come and visit us when it's safe to visit, but I don't know anything about flowers and, and really in England or Scotland. A little more about flowers in Ireland. And then that's about it. Well, it's great. I, um, I just appreciate you all being on the call. I hope you, I hope you enjoyed the photos and I hope you learned a little, some little tidbits about some of the, some of the plants. Yeah. Another, another big round of applause for Judy for this. Thank you all for joining us Thank on you. a Saturday. I hope you all get a chance to go out this weekend and see some flowers for yourself or wherever it's, whenever it's flower season, wherever you are. Um, and if you have any further questions, if you have any trouble with, um, if you don't get the list of emails, that sort of thing, I've left my email at chat. You can just email me at drew at evolves.org and then we can follow up with you. So thank you everybody. Okay, great. Great.